So today we have three people going to interact with us. Uh, Dr. Vaishali Moore is going to uh, moderate the session. She's a consultant pediatric nephrologist uh, and she's right now fellow at BJ Vadia Hospital. Uh, and her area of interest is towards general pediatric nephrology, okay. acute kidney injury and hypertension. And she is afflicted to many hospitals and she runs her own clinic uh, Tara Tara Children's Kidney Care Center and she has got more than 30 publications national and international. She is also an ex-editor of Pediatric Clinics of India. She is also an ex-professor of Unit Head Pediatrics at MUHS. Over to Dr. Uh, Vaishali Moore to moderate the session and introduce the speakers. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kalaiwani and your entire team for uh, giving me this opportunity and also thank you very much for the kind introduction. I congratulate you for consistently every year bringing such wonderful programs to us and uh, keeping us updated even in spite of the lockdown. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Dalpa, uh, Jalpa Dave, uh, who is a who is a Vadia alumni. Uh, we also had a um, short span of uh, time where we worked together at uh, when she was with us at SRCC Children's Hospital. Dr. Jalpa is a consultant pediatric nephrologist at KJ Patel Children's Hospital, Gujarat, and also at Parul Sevashram Hospital in Gujarat. And she has her own clinic at Tender Kidney Care in Gujarat. Uh, her specific ad academic interests are critical care, glomerular diseases, acute and tubular disorders. She has also won prizes for posters as well as uh, 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 papers presented in IPNA and the uh, uh, Peritoneal Dialysis Conference uh, uh, from Vadia. Uh, so uh, she is going to talk to us about uh, cystinosis today. My first encounter with cystinosis was a patient that I saw 20 years ago. And this particular patient had presented with uh, um, severe uh, uh, photophobia uh, and a lot of uh, polyuria and polydipsia. Uh, the, the, this particular patient was diagnosed because of the photophobia. From there till now, we have come a long way and uh, Jalpa is going to speak to us about cystinosis. The other speaker for the day today is another dynamic young girl, uh, Dr. Disha Patel, but who also has uh, done her fellowship from Vadia Children's Hospital. And she is going to uh, uh, speak to us about uh, idiopathic hypercalciuria. Uh, she is a consultant pediatric nephrologist and she is also attached to GCS Medical College and Research Center and Dr. Jeevraj Mehta Smarak Health Foundation, Jaydi Pediatric Super Speciality Hospital. She practices in Ahmedabad in Gujarat. So today we have two dynamic, young, promising pediatric nephrologists who are going to speak to us on one uncommon and one relatively common disorder that we see in our practice. So over to Dr. Jalpa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharp Man, for the generous introduction. Uh, okay, let me share my. Uh, is my slide visible? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kalaiku, ma'am, and team for giving me such a big opportunity to present on such a wonderful platform with vibrant audience in front of me. Uh, today, the topic has been given to me is cystinosis, pathogenesis, and management. So before we go to the talk, some of you might be knowing her. She is one of the famous American red star, uh, Bill Peterson, popularly known as Bill Pitt. She is the one who is also suffering from cystinosis. Recently, she won a reality pageant show. And uh, in the interview, she has shared her journey as a cystinosis patient throughout. Currently, she is 27 years old. The diagnosis for her was made in the childhood period. And uh, you know what she said about the disease was, in her words, nothing is unaffected by it. This disease can affect almost all organs of your body at one point of time, kidneys and eyes being the most commonly affected uh, systems. She even had to undergo dialysis at around 12 years of age. She received kidney transplant from her own brother at around 14 years of age. And currently she is on that system in replacement and doing pretty good, right? So I just gave this example to uh, 
tell you that you know cystinosis is definitely a difficult disease to live with but it is not impossible to live with this disease right even cystinotic patients if managed adequately on timely basis can have a very decent lifestyle so with this i would like to start my talk usually i do prefer you know interactive session on case presentation basis but to go for that case presentation we need to know a little bit of theory so this talk is something about theory of cystinosis we would be discussing the definition the physiology etiopathology the clinical presentation of the disease the diagnosis and management let's start with definition cystinosis is an inherited in the autosomal recessive type lysosomal storage disorder which is characterized by defective transport of cystine out of the lysosome leading to cystine accumulation in many of the organs majority being kidneys and eyes so on the top right corner in the sketch you can see it is a inherited disorder associated with cystine accumulation and mainly affecting kidneys and eyes few interesting facts about this disease cystinosis is the first treatable lysosomal storage disorder which was kind of discovered it is the most common cause of renal fanconi syndrome leading to end stage renal disease at one point of time but yet it is considered an orphan disease with the incidence being recorded as 1 in 1 lakh to 2 lakh population except there is clustering in few regions because of the founder effect because it is autosomal recessively inherited right? little bit about history you know this disease has been known to mankind since almost last 100 years about the century as early as 1903 one of the kind of you know you can say a controversial biochemist was british amil abelholden was the one who first identified something related to cystine deposition he named this disease as a familial cystine accumulation disease he described a child with severe growth failure in infancy who had cystine crystals deposited in his liver and spleen at the time of autopsy and he also had history of two sibling death right and after a few months this uh, disorder was labeled as abdelholden kaufman lignet syndrome kaufman was the physician who was treating that kid and lignet was the pathologist who kind of identified the pathological changes this was as early as in 1903 but uh, it took another three decades till 1930s to know about the actual nature and history of this disease Pantini, Detoni, and Dupree recognized the renal tubular defect component of this uh, disorder in 1930s. After almost another three decades, the basic pathological uh, phenomena responsible that lysosome are the responsible organelle for this disease was identified. In 1982, the impaired lysosomal cystine transport was detected, and in 1987, almost 30 to 40 years from this date. therapy with cystine drug was came into picture so you know we have the treatment for this disease for last 30 years but still not each and every individual is getting the treatment why we will be covering in our next slides to understand the pathogenesis we has to go back to medical school for a bit so we all remember lysosome right it is the organelle which is central to the macromolecular degradation and recycling in cytoplasm of our cell this figure depicts very nicely the different function of lysosome it is involved in degradation and recycling of intracellular substrate as well as some extracellular substrate with the help of late endosome it is also taking part in signaling the nutrient sensing and control of energy metabolism with uh, signals from nucleus it is also taking part in plasma membrane repair with specialized secretion uh in cystinosis one of the mechanism involved with lysosome is cystine is one of the amino acid which is produced by hydrolysis of various protein with the help of acid hydrolysis which is present in lysosome so 
This cysteine amino acid is then oxidized to cysteine within lysosome with the help of uh, enzyme and leading to a generation of disulfide bond. But this cysteine, cysteine is very poorly soluble in aqueous media, so it is not able to, you know, cross the lysosomal membrane by its own. So to cross the lysosomal membrane, the cysteine molecule needs help of a transmembrane protein, which is known as cystinosin. It is basically a seven-unit transmembrane protein. So with the help of the cystinosin, the cysteine will be extruded into the cytoplasm from the lysosome. And during this process, uh, even the H plus is needed, energy is needed in the form of hydrogen ATP is uh, pump uh, used. Cystinosis means accumulation of cysteine, right? So there can be two possibilities. Either it can be excess production of cysteine in the lysosome because of some defective enzyme, or it can be impaired excretion. The cysteine is uh, forming at a normal rate, but the excretion is impaired, right? So in this disease, the excretion is responsible. It occurs due to the impaired excretion of cysteine from lysosome into the cytoplasm and ultimately leading to cysteine accumulation in the lysosome. So as early as in 1998, the gene responsible for uh, this uh, cystinosin protein was discovered, that is CTNS gene, which is uh, located on chromosome 17 P13. And uh, till date, there are more than 100 pathogenic mutations had been recorded, the most common mutation being 57 KB deletions. Cystinosis is one disease, you know, which has a very good phenotype genotype correlation. Meaning, if there is a severe genotype, then it is severe phenotype as well. But over a period of time, we have found that you know, there are some people who are not matching their genotype level. So now it has been discovered that is that there is existence of these modifier genes responsible for the broad range of phenotypic manifestation in patients with cystinosis. So in this figure, you can see that CTNS gene, along with that 1570 KB deletion, there is also another gene that is CARCAL CAR gene is involved. So this is kind of a modifier gene which can lead to different phenotypic manifestation in cystinosis. Coming to pathology, as we know, ultimately there will be excessive cystine deposition in various organs. It may be your cornea, conjunctiva, liver, spleen, kidneys, intestine, pancreas, all of the endocrine glands, nothing is spared from this uh, deposition. The crystals are generally hexagonal or rectangular and they appear by refrigerant under polarizing light. And out of all these organs, kidney is the first organ being affected by it and it is the most commonly affected organ. So from the healthy kidney on the left side, ultimately the sustained deposition will lead to the sick kidney on the right side. What is the pathogenesis in kidney uh, disease uh, because of cystinosis? Is the first A, like if you see the natural history, first will be the proximal tubular damage because lysosomes are mainly accumulated in the proximal tubular cells. Followed by later on involvement of glomerulus as well, leading to FSGS kind of a picture with photocyte disease. And ultimately, it can lead to progressive chronic kidney disease because of that renal interstitial inflammation and fibrosis. So, this is a very beautiful slide I had taken from Elena Map. In this, you can see how the proximal tubular dysfunction occurs in patients with cystinosis. First, there will be loss of all the proximal tubular cells into urine because of uh, that apoptosis, that will be impaired mitochondrial function, oxidative stress, etc. Ultimately, leading to loss of significant proximal tubular cell mass. So, because of that, there will be a typical swan neck deformity. In this picture, you can see because of the loss of PT cells, ultimately your tubule will become an elongated and it can give rise to one kind of a picture, which is very pathognomic histological finding of cystinosis. The other, like after having the proximal tubular damage over a period of time, the patient might experience photocyte dysfunction, leading to FSGS kind of a picture, and ultimately it will be renal interstitial inflammation and fibrosis. Why? Because 
because of its cystine deposition that will be pro inflammatory as well as inflammatory cytokines and chemokines will be generated in the cell which will damage your tubules at one point of time and can progress the patient to chronic kidney disease in the eye the second most common organ affected from cystinosis the changes will be the retina can exhibit patchy hypopigmentation there will be crystal deposition in cornea conjunctiva occasionally in iris and rarely with retina as well so you can see on slit lamp examination you can see the crystals which are there okay so coming to types of cystinosis there are three types first one known as infantile nephropathic cystinosis which is the most common and most severe one because of two severe cpis mutation almost more than 90% of patients suffering from cystinosis come under this category the other one that is intermediate one previously known as juvenile or adolescent onset cystinosis in which the phenotype is a bit mild the one but they will also develop anxiety and disease at one point of time and last ocula one which was previously known as adult or late onset cystinosis in which there is no renal failure or retinal hypopigmentation seen only the bone marrow and cornea deposits of cystine and the only manifestation of this ocula variant is photophobia right so after this pathophysiology and you know the type specs uh, relax a bit no they may look alike their name may sound same but they are not same right similarly one must remember cystinosis and cystinuria are not same at all cystinosis is one of the rated disease leading to and stage renal disease definitely in one point of time but cystinuria is relatively benign compared to cystinosis in which there is just increased amount of cystine in urine leading to nephrocalcinosis not more than that so let's discuss the clinical features of infantile nephropathic cystinosis as we expect the antenatal scan in such patients would be absolutely normal there should not be any kidney uh, abnormalities no hydronephrosis no raised hypogenicity in fact the newborn period will also go absolutely normal without any signs or symptoms but almost all patients by 6 to 12 months of age will definitely develop few features related to proximal renal tubular dysfunction which starts as early as 6 months of age one should be very suspicious and one should be having a high degree of suspicion to detect the kid at this level so the renal manifestation as we all know that because of proximal tubular dysfunction they will be having signs and symptoms of proximal renal tubular acidosis due to impaired concentrating abilities they will develop polyuria polydipsia nocturia episodes of acute dehydration here comes the catch that you know it's very difficult for a parent for a mother to come with you that their child is having excessive urine he doesn't bother until there is oliguria so one if you are suspecting uh, from the clinical examination that the child is having some failure to try one must ask the history of polyuria no matter what you are going whether it is cardiac or any other reason but history of polyuria must be asked for no one is going to tell you that okay my kid is having increased frequency okay. so because of all this feature the biochemistry will be like that will be hypokalemia hyponatremia normal anion gap metabolic acidosis and uh, this is one of the patients suffering from the same so because of that proximal tubular dysfunction that will be phosphaturia hypophosphatemia leading to signs and symptoms of rickets hypercalciuria can sometimes lead to nephrocalcinosis as well loss of carnitine in urine can lead to poor muscle mass at some extent or low molecular weight protein beta 2 microglobulin etc will be excreted in urine it is practically very difficult but still the spanconi syndrome index is something which you can take a help to diagnose proximal tubular dysfunction that is daily urinary excretion of 21 amino acids per kg body so it will be always more that is around the range of 1 millimole per kg per day while the normal value of it is only 94 to 100 micromole per kg per day so this is all about 
initial years of uh, cystinosis. As soon as the child grows, if we have not started him on treatment, by six to seven years of age, the podocyte disease will set in and gradually we will be going towards developing chronic kidney disease. The tubular loss has become less prominent and the signs and symptoms of glomerular damage will become more prominent. And if not treated, they will definitely develop end stage renal disease by 10 to 12 years of age. This is all about the renal part of cystinosis. What are the extra renal manifestations? So, uh, this lysosome is also very important for melanocytes. So, uh, because of the fact in lysosomal cystine uh, excretion, the patient might be having blonde hair, white skin because melanocytes will also be affected. The patient will be having poor growth. And, you know, in initial one to two year of life, the patient might look like having a relative microcephaly. It's very common because the height and weight won't be increasing at the same rate as the height circumference. Regarding ocular manifestation, the skin deposits starts accumulating as early as 12 months of age. But this is a very important thing that slit clamp examination is must to pick up the cystin deposits. Why? Because during my post-graduation and residency, I had come across one case. You know, he was uh, like uh, three, to, uh, three to four years of age. He was uh, having this uh, kidney failure and uh, he was sent to ophthalmologist. After examination came normal and somehow it was decided that he might be having that pentelibical syndrome. With, uh, like he was getting treated for the same. Then say around six, seven years of age, Somehow, after examination was repeated, and at that time, during sleep plan, it came to occur that he was having that cystine crystals in his cornea. So, they were definitely there at three years of age when he was examined. But on detailed evaluation of this ophthalmologist notes, it was seen that because the child was uncooperative, they have just examined him superficially, they have not done the sleep plan examination. And that's how they miss that crystals, right? The clinical features because of this deposit will be the child might be having photophobia. He may not like to go out in sun at all. There can be constant watering of eyes. Nowadays, this can be mistaken by the child is having screen time a lot. Definitely screen time will affect eyes, but the other symptoms will also be taken care of. Other is black spasm. That will be irregular and peripheral depigmentation of retina, which can, in a later day, can lead to some form of visual impairment as well. Hepatomegaly and splenomegaly. Hepatomegaly because of that cystine deposits, and that will lead to, at one point of time, portal hypertension. And because of that portal hypertension, there can occur hypersplenism and splenomegaly. There are few cases in adults who literally require splenectomy for that hypersplenism secondary to portal hypertension secondary to the cystine deposits. Hi out of all the endocrine uh, manifestation, hypothyroidism is the most common. Usually, it sets in by 10 to 12 years of age and they do require thyroxine supplements. Diabetes is also common because of uh, pancreas involvement. Muscle weakness, these are mainly seen in adult people as well. And in later age group, they might have because of the pharyngeal and pharyngeal muscle involvement, that will be difficulty in swallowing, etc. Because of that uh, restrictive uh, movement of uh, muscle, there will be pulmonary dysfunction, which will be reflected as a restrictive adult disease. And uh, because of that atrophy of your intraosseous muscle, sometimes in elderly age group, you might find claw hand as well. And because it affects all the organs, the patient might be having delay, puberty and affection in his fertility level. There can be neurological dysfunction in the form of some cognitive affection as well as cardiovascular dysfunction. Uh, Jalpa, sorry to interrupt. Like yeah. your voice is echoing. Can you uh, stay a little away from the mic? There is okay. too much of echo. Yeah. Okay. Is it... Is it okay? Okay. So, in nutshell, your cystinosis patient can go to any of the pediatric subspecialty. 
it can go to orthopedic or general pediatric for treatment of rickets it can go to endocrinologist for treatment of short stature it can go to cardiologist for periodic trial it can come to you for enuresis as i say for parents enuresis is something which is alarming but the child might be passing excessive urine in daytime also but he won't give so much importance to that complete he can come with hypertension they can come with uh, visual impairment they can go to orthopedic because of limb deformity because of the cardiac changes or they can present to you as they as having chronic kidney disease that means that is they can come to you in end stage development this is just a small sketch to remember that uh, cystinosis can affect a patient from head to toe it can affect their brain eyes throat thyroid lung your pancreas liver kidneys your reproductive system your bones your muscles everything if not treated on the right time few lines regarding juvenile onset cystinosis they usually present directly with proteinuria and end stage renal disease the renal pancreas syndrome are less likely to be seen with this kind of uh, presentation but yes ocular manifestation will be there and ocular on like ocular cystinosis or adult onset cystinosis will be having no renal manifestation there will be only corneal and bone marrow deposits of cystine okay how to diagnose this condition history 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 and history detailed history and high degree of clinical suspicion is very important to pick up this disease on earlier basis and one has to look the clinical examination finding one has to especially look for the signs and symptoms of decay all those by the of the stichitis of prostate etc the short stature the blood pressure all this thing are very important the supportive test to diagnose biochemical abnormalities of rth i already discussed that is that the normal anion metabolic acidosis the really hypokalemia hyponatremia hypophosphatemia phosphatemia hypercalcemia etc etc and what are the specific tests to confirm the diagnosis of cystinosis the blood investigation the only uh, like uh, blood biochemical investigation we have is peripheral blood leukocyte cystin sampling the normal value is around 0.2 nanomol half cystin per milligram of protein and at the time of diagnosis the value can be as high as 3 to 20 3 nanomole half cystine per milligram of protein and the ocular cystinosis patient can have values ranging between 1 to 5 and the heterozygous values are less than 1 like uh, the one who are carriers and the patient who is on cystine therapy from beginning will have the value as low as less than 1 and this should be actually our target when we are treating the patient with cystine the other like definite test is sleep lab examination of eye which can be done by like you know by trimers of age you can able to pick up the cystine crystal deposition and molecular analysis this is of cystinosis gene coming to management symptomatic and specific code in symptomatic management because of that proximal rta kind of a picture there should be free access to water and toilet for the kid you know one might have to talk to the school authorities to allow this kid to use washroom frequently because they are usually poorly or poorly dipsic etc the calorie intake should be 100 to 130 percent of your recommended daily allowance supplementation of electrolyte losses like the child might require potassium citrate sodium bicarbonate sometimes this kids require as high as 10 to 15 mg per kg per day of uh, bicarbonate supplements treatment of rickets in the form of phosphate supplements in the, with the active session and activated vitamin d supplements as well as the vitamin d and calcium if required another aspect some this is again a controversial thing whether to give indomethacin or non there are many studies which have been done for the same some feel that indomethacin at one point of time can affect your kidney function and can you know kind of fasten the end stage renal disease development but some say that it might help the child's appetite and you know may make his life better if given with the caution for a short duration of time Similarly, 
uh, S inhibitors for proteinuria. Again, there are conflict of uh, interest whether we should give it or not because at one point it can affect uh, kidney uh, function. But one thing is sure from all the studies, one should never ever give both the drugs simultaneously. It should not happen that you are put this on endomethacin for polyuria and S inhibitors for proteinuria. Uh, regarding uh, poor growth, if you have controlled all the biochemical parameters adequately and still the growth is not adequate, then you can consider the fit for growth hormone treatment. The hormone replacement might be needed in some kids for thyroxine, even testosterone, and insulin in some patients. Renal replacement therapy, if required, and when whenever required. Now, something about the specific treatment that is just to mean drug. So, here is the mechanism of action of this drug. So, if you can see in the left sided figure that system and will bind to cysteine in the lysosome and it will form the mixed disulfide and cysteine amino acid. Cysteine, being easily uh, soluble in aqueous medium, can transport from the lysosomal membrane to cytoplasm and further it can go towards the protein uh, production or it can be metabolized further with the help of glutathione enzyme. And the mixed disulfide will again act with the another molecule of cysteine drug. And the cycle with function. On the right side of the drug, you can see the study was performed in 1976. It was before the drug came into market, in which you can see on the y axis that's intracellular non protein cysteine content and the concentration of various cysteine in the in vitro medium. So, with the higher concentration of cysteine, you are able to bring down the intracellular cysteine concentration at very low level. And cysteine will definitely improve kidney function survival. The tablets are available as 100, 150 and 50 mg. The dose is usually 10 to 50 mg per kg per day every 6 hours. Maximum dose in pediatric, you can go up to 1.9 gram per meter square per day. And you should start with one sixth or one fourth of daily dose and gradually optimize the next six. And you have to monitor your leukocyte cysteine level initially every monthly, then by, uh, every three monthly, and then annually. And systemic eye drops tablets is not substitute for eye drop because the tablet won't cross the barrier. And for the symptom relief of corneal deposits, one has to use the eye drop. There is the another study which, uh, in which you can see that uh, the patient who had received systemic have definitely good uh, outcome in terms of creatinine clearance. And those who had never received systemic, they developed the end stage renal disease a pretty early in their uh, life rather than those who had received the treatment. This was a 20 year single center experience from Italy, which also again showing the first, uh, like, uh, it is really comparing that when you have started the drug less than like around three years or more than three years. The earlier you start the system, in, they found that you are able to maintain the intracellular, the intraleukocyte cysteine content in a very uh, good way. Similarly, the earlier you start, it may be you will be able to achieve your target concentration with a relatively less dose. Again, the development of uh, end stage renal disease can be retarded for a pretty long duration of time if we have started the medicine as early as two years. You know, if we have started after two years, again, the effectiveness might decrease significantly. Side effect, no medicine is without side effects. So this has tremendous gastrointestinal side effects in terms of vomiting or bowel, uh, alteration of bowel habits. Bad order and bad breath, which is one of the major reasons for poor compliance in adolescent age group. Again, for developing patients, cost is the major drawback because this medicine one needs to continue even after kidney transplant because you need to have this medicine to prevent the deposition of cysteine into other organs. And as I mentioned, oral drug is not substitute for eye drop. Availability of systemic, we all know there is a major discrepancy between developed nations and developing nations. Major limitation of this use in developing countries, especially in India also, we, have, we don't have any local pharmaceutical producing this drug and we have to port this drug from outside. And you know, 
the tablet, the one one fifty mg systemic tablet cost almost two point seven nine euro. If it is important from France, and almost around one dollar. One dollar is also in US description. So for countries like us, it is very difficult to start this treatment in the patients who require it more from the poor social economic class. And uh, over an average cost for say around ten kg kit will come almost twenty five to thirty thousand in payment. So here is also one paper I found. It was published in BMC Nephrology Journal, which showed the worldwide view of nephropathic cystinosis and survey from thirty countries, which again showed they had a uh, total of two hundred and thirty patients were identified from thirty nations, and the result then. Seven percent of these patients from uh, developing countries died at the median age of five years because of not availability of system and not able to start the medicine. More patients had reached the end stage renal disease in developing nations initially within a short time of evolution of this disease. But yes, however, the renal survival was not statistically different between the developing and developed nations when the patients initiated the treatment after three years of age. Here again, the emphasis on early start of the medicine. We do have some foundation. One of us, which is uh, that based in Chennai, Andhra, that is by Doctor Tim Ravi Chandran, that uh, help few kids who require this medicine. But again, many kids are that which require this, and some say we all need to make an effort so that this medicine can be available to us in a reasonable uh, way for our patient. Last kidney transplant and cystinosis. We all know we have got excellent graph survival. Immunosuppressive regimen is similar to non-cystinosis patient. The disease doesn't reappear in kidney graph, and parents are accepted as donors because they will be heterozygotes, and heterozygotes never develop the disease. So parents can give kidney to their kids, and systemic treatment has to be restarted and continued lifelong even after kidney transplant. These are the few drugs in pipeline. Like uh, mainly, all these are involved with the inflammatory process. That is, immunomodulators like anakinra and anisotretinoin, like these are mainly used to block the biological activity of the inflammatory mediators. The recent uh, kind of uh, group of drugs which has drawn our attention is the cytochromosomes inhibitors group of drugs, which is basically a Enzyme responsible for the inflammatory loop in cystinotic tissue, but still the trials have not yet been started. It is just one drug which we may think it can help us. But this thing I found that hematopoietic stem extension transplantation already the clinical trials have been started, uh, and uh, we are expecting that they will be completed by August 2024, and they have they are planned to enroll six participants and see the effect of stem cell transplant. So, take-home message will be: diagnosis of cystinosis needs high degree of clinical suspicion. You know, we should be creating awareness to all the uh, physicians or pediatricians of our knowledge so that they should pick up the disease early. They should try suspecting fibular dysfunction in patients with failure to try polyuria, etc. All patients with renal sanguinis syndrome must be screened for cystinosis. Cystinin remains the mainstay of therapy. But the earlier they start, the better result will get, and it has to be continued post transplant as well. And two of the novel therapies are still underway to clinical trials. Uh, thank you, thank you for the listening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jalpa. Uh, that was a wonderful uh, presentation. You have covered uh, almost everything. There are two questions in the chat box. uh i think we will uh, be taking them at the end uh so uh, now we will move on to the next presentation on uh, idiopathic hypercalciuria um dr disha you may take over good evening everyone uh jalpam can you please stop sharing your screen yes i have thank you Good evening, everyone. It gives me an immense pleasure to present in this series. Uh, so today I am going to discuss idiopathic hypercalciuria. Just a minute. Let me make it full screen. Okay. 
yeah so we'll start with the talk uh the idiopathic hypercalcemia term is, uh, has been described yeah, in... it, is, it doesn't come in full screen okay it's not in slide show i think you have to go click on to the slide show or open the slide show and then uh, go back and share just a minute the next to that you have it next to the animations no open it fully in the slide show and then share your screen okay for me ma i'm able to see the slide okay uh, disha you have any animations uh, no uh, not as such Okay, then it should work. It's visible, sir. Ah, oh, I can see the whole slide, huh? Okay, okay, fine, sir. We'll carry it. Disha, next to home, in the same line, go to slide show. Ahead of that oh, is animation. Upon that, there is a toolbar, so I'm pressing on it, and it's going to mute this thing. Okay, okay. So just give me a second. No problem. Take your time. So basically, idiopathic hypercalcemia. The word has been coined by Albright and et al. in 1983. Ah, uh, so coming to the other, uh, just just. Okay. Is it full screen now? No. It's no. okay. It's okay, but slides are visible. If you are comfortable, we'll go ahead. Okay, fine. So, few facts about the uh, idiopathic hypercalciuria. The most common underlying, its most common underlying metabolic risk factor for nephrolithiasis, and the prevalence of that to varies in the pediatric age group between 2.2 to 6.4 percentage. Uh, it is associated in almost 75 to 80 percentage of the children who are having a uh, kidney uh, stones, and in adult patient, the uh, association uh, varies between 40 to 50 percentage. Uh, it, uh, it can affect any age, including newborn, and it equally affects both the gender, uh, including uh, girls and boys. The peak incidence of the same is there in the uh, children aging uh, four to eight years, and there is actually a high morbidity uh, with or without lithiasis, and the uh, reduced bone den uh, mineral density is the major uh, worrisome thing about the idiopathic hypercalciuria. So uh, let me take you to some molecular. Molecular basis of the uh, whole thing. Uh, the molecular mechanism of the tubular calcium reabsorption uh, has been shown in the uh, picture. Uh, in the proximal tubule, more than sixty percentage of the filtered ionized calcium gets reclaimed, and it is basically a sodium-driven uh, water reabsorption. Which is driven by a sodium uh, uh, proton exchanger uh, isoform type three, and the calcium is getting reabsorbed by the paracellular uh, pathway, and that is by clouding two and twelve. Uh, the uh, sodium efflux uh, uh, occurs from the so, uh, NK ATPase and the uh, sodium bicarbonate co-transporter at the basolateral side. And this is the major site for the reclaimed uh, reclamation of the filtered uh, load of the calcium. Uh, next uh, on the list is the uh, 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 thick ascending lip of the uh, loop of Henle, where almost 20 to 25 percentage of the filtered uh, calcium is getting reabsorbed. Uh, so uh, the, here also it is uh, majorly driven by paracellular pathway, but cloud in uh, this involved is 16 and 19. 
and uh, it is basically regulated by a uh, uh, csr uh, receptors which are there on the basolateral surface and uh, it is uh, getting affected by clouding protein in the way that uh, csr uh, itself inhibits the clouding protein and it further blocks the paracellular calcium reclamation from this segment and the basolateral efflux of the chloride is getting done by a uh, clck uh, na and nb channels from this Uh, part now uh, and lastly the distal convoluted tube uh, along with the collecting tubule plays the role uh, for the tiny fine regulation of uh, rest of the 10 to 15 percentage of the calcium reclamation here the pathway is transcellular and it is by uh, uh, trans receptor uh, potential type 5 and nccp and uh, this is the uh, also affected by sodium calcium exchanger ncx the molecular mechanism uh, altering the reabsorption uh, it affects the genetic uh, it uh, it is having genetic association in form of variation in uh, clouding 9 uh, 14 and csr and most commonly the idiopathic hypercalciuria uh, runs in the family in form of autosomal dominant uh, uh, trait which is having incomplete uh, penetrance and uh, 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 the actual definition of the uh, idiopathic hypercalciuria it's the uh, renal over excretion of the calcium despite of the normal serum calcium level and in after excluding all the secondary causes of the hypercalciuria so urinary calcium excretion uh, when it is uh, uh, estimated by 24 hour urinary cal uh, calcium excretion it is more than 4 mg per kg per day uh, irrespective of the age of the uh, person and sex of the person um but it is very cumbersome to do the 24 hour urinary collection and estimation of the uh, solutes uh, clearance uh, so the determination uh, of the ratios to creatinine uh, helps uh, in this particular scenario on uh, the fasting during samples are preferred although it's not uh, necessary to check from the fasting samples only the higher the uh, uh, the uh, cut off uh, of almost more than 95th percentile uh, age appropriate cut off has been mentioned here in infants it's more than 0.8 in preschool children it is more than 0.4 in uh, uh, children and adolescents it's more than 0.21 a uh, caveat here is it is actually affected by diet diurnal variation and the posture of the child also and extraneous other activities also uh, it uh, actually assumes that the child is having normal muscle mass for the age so the uh, spot urinary calcium creatinine ratio tends to overestimate the uh, actual calcium excretion in a child who is actually having low muscle mass uh, the sensitivity of the urine calcium creatinine ratio of the spot value is around 89 percentage and the specificity seems to be low which is 59 percentage as confirmed with the 24 hour urinary calcium excretion uh, to overcome the effect of the low muscle mass uh, we can use spot urine calcium and osmolarity ratio it is actually a better indicator uh, to estimate the hypercalciuria in children with the low muscle mass Uh, so what is true idiopathic hypercalciuria uh, the time estimation of 24 hour urine collection is mandatory uh, it's uh, preferable to have two consecutive collections uh, it is uh, the excessive urinary uh, calcium excretion and it it is without any dietetic manipulation uh, without dietetic manipulation uh, is uh, in the form of the child is on daily diet which is having a calcium uh, load of almost 1 1000 to 1200 mg and the protein intake of the child should not be more than 1 to 1.5 g uh, per kg per day so dietary factors uh, plays a key role in the urinary calcium excretion uh, being uh, most important is uh, animal protein sodium and potassium and the uh, large uh, carbohydrate lo uh, load also is important so animal load indirectly induces the acid uh, load and it promotes the skeletal uh, calcium loss and it causes a reabsorptive hypercalciuria 
uh, sodium is actually an important player here. The tubular reabsorption of calcium is inhibited by the uh, tubular sodium. So, increase in the sodium intake increases the urinary calcium excretion, uh, while the decreasing the intake uh, significantly decreases the excretion of the calcium. Uh, dietary potassium, uh, which is there in the fruits and vegetables, are in the form of salts of anions, uh, which confers good alkali load, which is uh, either in the form of bicarbonate uh, uh, salts or in the uh, citrate salts, which is ultimately being converted into bicarbonate and it decreases the acid load overall and it uh, helps to uh, counterweight the uh, uh, reabsorptive type of the hypercalciuria. Uh, the other important thing is the phosphorus. Uh, dietary uh, phosphorus, when it, when it is in the uh, decreased uh, uh, state or uh, when it, whenever there is renal phosphate leak, uh, there is uh, 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 by vitamin D increased cal intestinal calcium absorption and uh, it, uh, it further increases the uh, level of the urinary calcium excretion. And the calcium uh, uh, the intake of the child should not be more than 1500 milligram per uh, uh, day because increase in the dietary calcium uh, itself causes the hypercalciuria. Uh, other important uh, factor is large bicarb uh, large carbohydrate loads. Uh, it, it is having inhibitory effect uh, by insulin and it, it causes the increase in the transient uh, 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 hypercalciuria. Uh, coming to pathogenesis of the disease, uh, there is a complex interplay between three important uh, organs here, which is bone, uh, the kidneys and the gut. Uh, and it is further orchestrated by uh, hormones uh, like 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, parathormone. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Yes, uh, please uh, press F5 because uh, uh, this is getting recorded. So we need to have it on uh, okay. right. uh, slide show mode. So coming to the pathogenesis of this thing, the, uh, uh, there is a complex interplay and it is uh, still not completely understood. Uh, idiopathic hypercalciuria is a systemic abnormality of the calcium homeostasis and there is an altered cellular transport uh, of the calcium in the intestine, kidneys and in the uh, gut. And it is further orchestrated by the hormones, which is uh, 125 uh, dihydroxy vitamin D, uh, parathormone hormone, uh, the uh, calcitonin levels, as well as the phosphatonins like FGF23. Uh, so, uh, pathogenesis uh, uh, actually has genetic background, uh, which is, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it is uh, driven by the autosomal dominant pattern of the inheritance, which is having incomplete penetrance and up to almost 50% of the patient have positive family history. We'll discuss this in detail. Uh, the first on the list is the absorptive hypercalciuria on the locus 1 q 23.3 q 24 which is actually characterized by increased intestinal calcium uptake there is a normal calciuria normal pth and low uh, bone mineral density and it may occur in autosomal dominant trait uh, then increased vitamin d receptor is also associated with idiopathic hypercalciuria the chromosome 9 q 33.2 to q uh, 34.2 uh, locus also uh, is inherited by autosomal dominant uh, mode and it is a major cause of nephrolithiasis in the uh, children and the other last on the list is calcium sensing receptor and hypercalciuric uh, uh, disorder uh, uh, actually casr regulates the pth secretion and the renal tubular calcium reabsorption is also regulated by calcium sensing receptor. Uh, the both of these are actually done in response to alteration in the extracellular calcium concentration. Uh, there are uh, basically three mechanisms which leads to idiopathic hypercalciuria. Uh, first is uh, either it could be increased intestinal calcium absorption or uh, type 1 being the direct increase in the intestinal calcium absorption or uh, type 2 is absorptive hypercalciuria which is mediated by excessive uh, vitamin D levels and the decreased renal absorption 
uh, of either calcium or phosphate can lead to type 3 absorptive hypercalciuria and uh, the third mechanism is enhanced bone resorption that is resorptive hypercalciuria uh, actually clinical attempt to differentiate all uh, three uh, these uh, mechanisms it not possible and it can it will not uh, help in the further management of the condition uh, so uh, there uh, the uh, there, is, uh, there is a uh, picture which can uh, which is showing the interplay uh, of the all the mechanism i have discussed so far uh, 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 let me uh, speak a little about renal calcium handling in idiopathic hypercalciuria. Uh, the role of decreased calcium reabsorption uh, leads to uh, is there, and that is increasing the fasting calcium excretion of the calcium, and there is also fasting hypercalciuria. Alternatively, uh, the uh, increased absorption of the calcium with meals causes a uh, post uh, absorptive uh, increase in the filtered load and uh, at identical serum calcium level and the uh, calcium filtered load the calcium excretion is really elevated uh, renal phosphate handling is uh, also affected there is abnormal phosphate excretion uh, there is a partly negative phosphorus balance even uh, in the uh, uh, patient with hypercalcy idiopathic hypercalciuria uh, on the normal diet and uh, many patients may exhibit a slightly decreased serum phosphate levels and perhaps frankly low levels can be seen in almost 15 to 20 percentage of the patient with idiopathic hypercalciuria uh, so uh, there is a red model in genetic uh, uh, genetically designed uh, which can help a lot to understand the uh, pathology and pathogenesis sorry to interrupt are your yeah. slides moving uh, yes it is which slide you are in i am on genetic uh, uh, hypercalciuric model of the red model. you are just stuck in pathogenesis slide the slides are in moving uh, uh, I think it is the other, it is the, the other, uh... Isha, you are there? I think she's logged in from two um, uh, different uh, places. So that's why you know, the, probably the slides are moving on one and not on the other. Uh, Disha, can you try moving your slides now? Put your slides on full screen and then uh, stop. Uh, you have already stopped sharing. Put your slides on full screen and then start sharing. Ma'am, can I request you to share my slides from your side if it's possible? Uh, Kalaiwani? You're not able to share the screen? Oh, uh, no, not actually. Yeah, one second. Really sorry for the whole situation. So till then, uh, let me take you ahead with clinical presentation of idiopathic hypercalciuria. Uh, it could it can be in the form of gross or microscopic hematuria. Uh, it uh, the idiopathic hypercalciuria is most common. Wait, metabolic wait, wait, just wait, no, like we'll put the slideshow and then you can present. One second, just okay. hold on. Okay.
Thank you, ma'am. So we were discussing the genetic hypercalciuric stone forming right model. Which slide you want me to be in? Uh, the next one, ma'am. Yeah. It's fine. Uh, the next. It's GSH right model. Yes, uh, perfect. Thank you so yeah. much. Uh, so the studies in the genetic hypercalciuric right has been demonstrated a normal calcemia. There is intestinal cal uh, calcium hyperabsorption. There is increased bone resorption and the uh, defect in the renal tubular reabsorption of calcium. And the alterations are there in both the proximal tubule as well as the thick ascending limb of the calcium uh, reabsorption. And more di uh, calcium delivery is there to the distal tubule. Uh, the uh, no, calcified levels which were demonstrated in the model were actually normal. And the uh, increase in number of the vitamin D receptors were there uh, uh, in the intestine, in the bone and the kidneys of these rats, as well as in the peripheral blood monocytes from the human with idiopathic hypercalciuria. Uh, so coming to a uh, clinical presentation, uh, the, uh, the uh, presentation varies widely. Uh, there could be gross or microscopic hematuria. The idiopathic hypercalciuria is the most common metabolic risk factor for hematuria. Uh, the voiding symptoms in form of urinary urgency, uh, polycnuria, dysuria, incontinence and enuresis are associated and they are very well known. The urinary tract infection is also associated and a recurrent UTIs can be a one of, of the a, a one of the presentation of the uh, situation. Uh, there is suprapubic pain, back uh, a flank and abdominal pain, even in the absence of urolithiasis, and uh, less uh, frequently, uh, idiopathic hypercalciuria is uh, demonstrated with the frank acute renal co uh, colic. So, idiopathic hypercalciuria and neurolithiasis, uh, it uh, has a strong association. The uh, IH is important cause of the nephrocalcinosis in childhood. Uh, in almost 13 to 35 percentage of the ca uh, causes, it's the uh, cases, it's the etiology. There is a risk of the uh, nephrolithiasis increases uh, with the increase in the level of hypercalciuria. Um, calcium can precipitate with the variety of urinary stone particularly the oxalate uh, uh, calcium stone, which is insoluble. And the long-term follow-up uh, uh, shows that in up to 85% of the uh, uh, children uh, can exhibit renal calyceal microlithiasis or nephrolithiasis ultimately. And the prevalence of urolithiasis in the uh, families which is having idiopathic hypercalciuria is actually between 34 to 59. Uh, coming to idiopathic hypercalciuria and urinary tract infection, the underlying mechanism is actually impairment of the uroepithelial. Uh, the microcrystals, which is the calcium oxalate microcrystals mainly, it blocks the close contact between the bacteria and uroepithelial. It forms kind of a safe barrier for the uh, bacteria and thus it slows down the defense mechanism and it prevents the mechanical removal of the bacteria via urine flow also. Uh, the microcrystal can uh, also provide a needles for the bacteria uh, sequestration and subsequently multiplication and full-blown UTI. Uh, it is a risk factor, a predisposing factor for the recurrent UTIs too. Uh, now, uh, uh, the uh, frequency of the idiopathic hypercalciuria, uh, it is higher in patients who have UTI than its prevalence in the normal population without any uh, 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 episodes of UTI. Uh, children with uh, UTI and a positive uh, family history of urolithiasis uh, uh, along with the parental consanguinity, it has to evaluate, has to be evaluated for the urinary calcium excretion, uh, provided there is a very high association of the IH in such scenario. The recurrence of UTI may be reduced by treatment of idiopathic hypercalciuria, and uh, there is also other uh, 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 
part which is recurrent abdominal pain uh, it is also an important uh, not so common symptom of presentation of idiopathic hypercalciuria uh, the idiopathic hypercalciuria and urinary sim uh, symptoms are uh, due to a uh, damage in the urinary epithelium which is caused by uh, micro crystals and uh, it is uh, it, uh, the mechanism of incontinence and voiding this uh, dysfunction is uh, due to calcium microcrystals uh, which causes irritation of the bladder epithelium which leads to contraction of retrosal or bladder outlet uh, relaxation and uh, uh, leading to involuntary voiding uh, uh, idiopathic hypercalciuria in infancy uh, it's not much established what's the exact prevalence there is no specific studies on urolithiasis due to hypercalciuria in this age group particularly infants with recurrent stone or microcalculi and uh, uh, microcalculi uh, should be uh, uh, investigated thoroughly to look for the presence of idiopathic hypercalciuria on uh, the association also goes high because infant formula may have increase in amount of calcium phosphorus oxalate uh, sulfates and vitamin d as compared to mother's milk uh, vitamin d given at the prophylactic doses in the formula fed children can cause a vitamin d excess and therefore it can cause hypercalciuria uh, the uh, major morbidity which is uh, there with uh, idiopathic hypercalciuria in pediatric age group is actually a bone disease a uh, major accumulation of bone mass occur in childhood and adolescence uh, with peak of that uh, in the second decade of the life any interference which can uh, lead to a uh, respect which can be a risk factor for reduction in the uh, optimum uh, bone mass and there is increased risk of fracture in the adulthood uh, reduced bone mineral density is demonstrated in pediatric patient with idiopathic hypercalciuria and uh, there is an inverse relation between the age of the child and bone mineral content age of the child meaning the age at when the idiopathic hypercalciuria has set in and that suggests that there is an adult post osteoporosis which uh, may begin early in the childhood uh, bone disease in idiopathic hypercalciuria uh, is uh, 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 the major uh, uh, morbidity and uh, many studies has been conducted uh, for that uh, it shows that the hypercalciuric calcium stone formers have actually decreased bone mineral density when compared to match controls which are neither strong uh, for, uh, formers not the hypercalciuric uh, one and the reduction in bmd in hypercalciuric pediatric patient with or without hematuria or uh, uh, urolithiasis is noted Uh, the uh, progressive reduction in the mineral content suggests that there is a, a key role of osteoblast and osteoclast in the chain of events and uh, the uh, osteoclastic and osteoblastic activities uh, is basically regulated by major number of cytokines the blood monocytes from the isolated uh, uh, patients with idiopathic hypercalciuria uh, they shows there are significantly increased uh, production of uh, cytokines uh, naming interleukin 1 gm csf and tnf alpha uh, which leads to increase in the osteoclastic activity and uh, it produces uh, the reduction in the bone mineral density ultimately Uh, so densitometry is the gold standard in diagnosing the bone mineral uh, disorder in children whole body density uh, whole uh, bone, uh, bone body density is being done and the test result is whenever the z score is uh, more than minus 2 standard deviation along with the clinical symptom osteoporosis can be labeled and osteopenia is suggested by z score of uh, minus 1 to minus 2 Uh, so there is a very a uh, nice article which is there in the uh, ipna uh, uh, recent uh, uh, one 2021 on the, the uh, it suggests the evolution of bone mineral density in the pediatric uh, patient with idiopathic hypercalciuria and it's one of a kind uh, study because a 20 year longitudinal study has been done uh, on uh, 34 patients and three uh, uh, bm uh, D, three timed bmd has been assessed the mean elapsing time between the bmd 1 and 3 estimation was 
17.7 years and uh, it is not well understood why uh, some patients uh, showed uh, uh, decline in the uh, uh, decline in the uh, bmd in their adolescence and there is a, redu a reduced excretion of calcium in citrate which has an impact on the lithogenic risk Um, there are two practical consensus which can be divided uh, derived from this study. First is carrying out routine bone densitometry in studies uh, routinely in IH patients. It's really not necessary. And the second is normalization of urine calcium excretion may be an indirect biochemical sign of the bone mass recovery. Uh, so uh, uh, coming to the next uh, 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 etiopathogenesis is renal tubular dysfunction in idiopathic hypercalciuria. Uh, it can be uh, encountered in patient with urolithiasis or nephrocalcinosis as a cell crystal in, uh, interaction, and it may lead to tubular damage and or uh, dysfunction. And it is very less likely that it uh, can be a primary cause of IH. And urinary uh, N-acetyl uh, beta D-glucosaminase uh, excretion uh, has been uh, demonstrated that it could be a uh, uh, either increased or normal in children with IH. Uh, and urine NAG is a marker of proximal uh, tubular damage, and there is no direct relationship stating that there is tubular impairment and degree of the calcium leakage. Uh, coming to the diagnosis of the idiopathic hypercalciuria. All the associated features uh, has to be look, uh, looked upon, uh, uh, stating uh, fa failure to thrive, rickets, sustained metabolic acidosis, dysmorphic features, proteinuria of any grade, and redu reduction in GFR. Uh, the uh, detailed uh, history has been uh, should be taken, uh, mentioning diet and medication history of the child and laboratory test. Uh, for uh, for blood and urine both has to be conducted uh, to rule out the secondary causes at least on uh, the long term coming to the management of situation long term management for the prevention of recurrence uh, aiming to reduce uh, or prevent the emergence of new stone prevent existing one to increase in the size and to reduce the morbidity and need for the surgical intervention Uh, non pharmacological as well as pharmacological modality is there non pharmacological is uh, approached first which is in form of increase in dietary modification uh, with high fluid intake low sodium and uh, protein and calcium should be given to child as per the uh, recommended daily allowance calcium uh, intake cannot be reduced for the growing child and uh, children routinely do not comply with this uh, recommendation and frequently they end up requiring anti calciuric therapy uh, so the indication for anti calciuric therapy here is uh, no normalization of the calcium excretion with dietary modification and uh, the first on the list is potassium citrate as a hypocalciuric agent the supplementation with alkaline potassium salt uh, uh, it reduces the endogenous as uh, uh, it, it causes reduction in the endogenous acid and it further reduces the urinary calcium excretion and overall reduction in the bone resorption in pediatric patient uh, potassium citrate decreases the recurrence of new stones and the growth of residual stone fragments following lithotripsy but no studies uh, are there to confirm the beneficial effect of potassium citrate therapy on the bone mass uh, pharmacological treatment with thiazide should be reserved it is uh, uh, it is mandatory only in three situation when there is marked clinical complaints such as uh, uh, the sustained dysuria frequent macroscopic hematuria or recurrent renal colic uh, there are uh, any histories of repeated uh, fractures and the stones or nephrocalcinosis on ultrasonography uh, the thiazide uh, has to be started the effect of thiazide uh, on the bone it may extend uh, beyond its anti calciuric action and probably it's related to stimulation of the osteoblastic bone formation um, with phosphonates in idiopathic hypercalciuria only a select number of children with hypercalciuria and decreased bmd uh, may need this therapy only uh, to be given by experts and short term treatment with bisphosphonates uh, is effective and bisphosphonates uh, should be prescribed only and only when all other measures fail 
to restore uh, the bone mineral density. Uh, does a low calcium diet is uh, 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 necessary for hyper uh, patient with idiopathic hypercalciuria? No, uh, because every measure has to be taken to ensure there is adequate calcium in growing child's diet with hypercalciuria. And if a child is not able to consume the uh, 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 calcium as per RDA, the supplementation should be done. But a low calcium diet are uh, really not advisable. Uh, so, uh, coming to vitamin D bone density and nephrocalcinosis in preterm infant, uh, there is a prospective study which was there uh, 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 in uh, May 2021. Uh, the study has been conducted in 56 infants. On an average, they received 447 international unit of vitamin D and their average serum 25 USD level was 39.6 at the end of the therapy. Uh, the uh, a very nice conclusion can be driven from the uh, study. Uh, it's the, basically vitamin D supplementation are based on full term infant and which can be a uh, not a optimum or appropriate dose to be given to preterm infant. Uh, preterm are already at high risk to develop nephrocalcinosis even without vitamin D supplementation. So the study speculates that the dosage of vitamin D uh, on the initiation of supplementation should be almost 400 international unit per day. Then it can be individualized with the close monitoring of the uh, serum uh, level every two weekly or four weekly estimation. And on this study, uh, the occurrence of nephrocalcinosis has been uh, shown on uh, the average vitamin 25 OH vitamin D level of 45.3. And uh, the, it proposes that the initial goal of the vitamin D level should be uh, between 30 to 40 nanogram per ml and not more than 40. Uh, so, uh, the effect of vitamin D treatment in dynamics of bone uh, formation in the urinary uh, tract and the bone density in children with idiopathic hypercalciuria. Uh, uh, there is uh, actually no uh, uh, literature suggesting what is the uh, effect of vitamin D. Uh, some supportive studies are there. Uh, from this study, the conclusion can be drawn that the supplementation with low doses of vitamin D, uh, that is 400 to 800 international unit a day in children with hyper idiopathic hypercalciuria, it significantly increases concentration of 25 OH vitamin D in the serum, but it does not affect the level of calciuria. So low dose vitamin D supplementation is fine with child of uh, a child having IH. Uh, it does not increase the dynamics of the stone formation in the urinary tract, but uh, also does not improve the bone density. So neither does it uh, having a beneficial effect on uh, bone density, uh, nor it is creating any uh, new stone formation. The use of vitamin D preparation in these patients are actually safe, and children with IH uh, should be advised uh, for careful monitor uh, to uh, be supplemented along with careful monitor of the parameters of calcium metabolism and level of urethiasis activity uh, without giving vitamin D supplementation. Uh, many thanks and really I'm sorry for the interruption of the session due to uh, technical issues. Um, uh, Disha, that was fine. In spite of the technical issues, we really enjoyed your talk. Uh, it was very much in detail and you have covered almost everything. Uh, so now let us move on to the uh, questions. There are a few questions here in the chat box also. So one question is, if you, I, I do not have any access to leukocyte, cysteine or genetic testing uh, in children with Fanconi. So Dr. Jalpa, how to make a diagnosis of cystinosis in that case is eye examination is normal. Does it in exclude cystinosis? Uh, and yes. Uh, first, I would like to say that now we have a facility of this uh, leukocyte cystine contained at our very own AIMS. So AIMS people in association with ICMR do peripheral leukocyte cystine level. So if anyone wants to do that, they can contact the appropriate channels. And uh, yes, if, if in spite of all this, you are not getting the level done, negative eye examination will not completely exclude. It depends when you are doing it. Usually by 12 to 24 months of age, cystine deposits do occur in almost all people. But you know, you have to 
be uh, in a close watch it might happen that after few months you can find uh, so if you are really suspecting cystinosis because of other features you should be doing repeatedly for a few months before excluding and by that time you can get in your uh, peripheral uh, leukocyte cystine level yeah previously we never had the leukocyte cystine levels or we never had genetic studies and it used to be a clinical diagnosis and as uh, dr jalpa had pointed out uh, many a times eye examination may have missed it or these diseases evolve over a period of time and the eye changes will come only after one and a half years 16 months to one and a half years so uh, as she rightly said you will have to uh, monitor the child on a regular basis the other question is that uh, many patients say that the eye drops are very painful so could we dilute the eye drops uh no ma'am because you know these drops are made with very stringent like formulation and it's not advisable to dilute them though uh now it is like they are saying that soon the gel will be available so that can be a good option but diluting it with normal saline is not advisable it will definitely affect the efficacy and yeah the gel the gel i think is higher concentration so the gel will probably be the one which is causing more uh, uh, burning and the aqueous probably will be a better one uh, the the gel advantage is that you can use it uh, less uh, frequently and the aqueous has to be used for almost 8 to 10 times in 24 hours so probably switching over to the other preparation may be an option for this uh, for these patients who are having a, a, a repeated uh, burning and uh, uh, pain uh, i have some uh, question for you uh, dr jalpa so what happens after transplant uh, the cystia i mean you said will have to be continued so what are the reasons for it can you elaborate a little on that yes ma'am yes ma'am because as we saw in the pathogenesis the basic defect is cystine accumulation in the lysosome so with kidney transplant we have only taken care part of the kidneys but there are all the other endocrine glands bones muscles brain etc which can have the cystine deposition and subsequent deteriorating effect on the same so one has to carry the system in uh, not like to be like not it should not be stopped up yeah so when you are giving systemic cystia i mean then what is the what is the requirement to give the uh, eye drops um uh, the eye, if you are yes. giving it systemically Yes, ma'am. Because it won't cross the barrier in eye, so they won't reach to the. There's no blood supply, so yeah, correct, correct. So, wow, uh, uh, you said there are a lot of GI side effects. So, what is the reason for the GI side effects, and what do you do with the side yes. for the side effect? Yes, ma'am. Uh, one of the uh, GI side effect, major one, is vomiting, and you know that acidic feeling, acidity kind of a picture, pain uh, followed by the poor food, etc. Because it has been seen, the reason not. Very clearly known, but it has been seen that the system in drug itself will increase the gastrin production and increase the gastric acid production per se. So usually, mostly they prescribe that you should take this drug along with pantoprazole or omeprazole because it can by itself can increase the gastric juice secretion. So that can be one reason for this thing. And uh, um, the pant. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Finish your finish your sentence. Yes, ma'am. So the bad order is mainly because of that disulfide bond, which is there, and because of that they are having bad order. That is also one side effect. So these two are the major one which can lead to poor compliance. Okay, okay. Thank you. Any other questions or any other comments from uh, our senior faculty members uh, who may be online? So let us move on to um, Dr. Disha. Uh, uh it was a nice talk in spite of the technical glitches very much in detail i really appreciate your uh, uh, the effort that you have taken to make this talk uh you said that first uh, and foremost is the dietary modification and uh, the water intake How long should one wait for the dietary modification and the water intake uh, uh, and and you know kind of uh, before adding on the uh, hypocalciuric treatment uh so the dietary modification of the uh, and the uh, increased fluid intake is basically aiming to reduce the uh, calcium excretion 
but whenever the reduction in the urinary calcium excretion is not uh, possible to be achieved on the dietary uh, modification as well as in increasing the fluid therapy uh, one should switch over to potassium citrate supplementation because uh, as we have seen from the talk the morbidity of uh, idiopathic hypercalciuria is actually high in terms of uh, micro uh, lithiasis and urolithiasis and nephrocalcinosis so uh, whenever there uh, the child fails to show improvement on dietary uh, modification and uh, fluid therapy potassium citrate is very well uh, needed for the uh, particular case i uh, uh, in my practice i prefer waiting for at least one one and a half months because uh, it takes time for the modification uh, uh, to be brought about and uh, to actually start uh, uh, helping the patient uh, there is a question how does low salt diet decrease the calcium excretion can you take that uh, yes because as uh, uh, the Uh, 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 whenever there is increase in the renal tubular uh, uh, filtered sodium level, uh, it it is going to increase the uh, uh, hypercalciuria level. Uh, after diminishing the so uh, sodium load in the uh, uh, glomerular filter, uh, there would be decrease in the uh, uh, renal uh, excretion of the calcium. In that way, reduction in the dietary salt is the first and foremost measure which has to be taken in the uh, form of the non-pharmacological management of the hypercalciuria. uh i also wanted to ask you you uh, um, uh, quoted the uh, bmd uh, study and uh, uh, in that study whether they have mentioned when both thiazide and uh, potassium citrate are given versus when potassium citrate are given the bone marrow densitometry is it different oh uh, ma'am actually uh, thiazide uh, is uh, 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 known to have, have beneficial effect in bone mineral density in adult population but mm. no such studies had, has been there to mention its bone, a beneficial role in the children uh, mm. so uh, it's not uh, uh, the uh, long term effect on the uh, bone mineral density which is given by thiazides uh there is another question which has come up what specific advice would you give patients in regard to protein intake uh so protein intake of the chi uh, child cannot be uh, diminished and the uh, protein intake should be continued as per the uh, recommended dietary allowance but intake should not exceed more than 1.5 g per kg per day of body weight and the source of protein should also be uh, not the animal uh, source of the proteins as it can uh, increase overall uh, acid load and uh, reabsorptive hypercalciuria uh, would be this uh, situation later on uh, when one consumes the animal protein so the nature should be not uh, the uh, lesser amount of the animal protein and amount is a particularly less than 1.5 g per kg per day yeah so i think there is only one question which i think dr jalpa has already answered are there any labs who are doing uh, leukocyte cysteine levels and uh, she has already said that uh, all india institute of medical sciences is doing it for us uh, any comments uh, from any of the uh, uh, senior members who are online Sir, you wanted to ask something. No, my no ma. I just said both are excellent presentations. Ma, very comprehensive. I think they should be proud of themselves for presenting such a good presentation. But I have one question to Dr. Jalpa. She has presented yes. two or three figures and put the Jalpa down. Is there any copyright for that thing? It is her own drawing, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, okay. I was asking whether we could use it for our slides or have to get permission from her. Question to Jalpa, Dom. Jalpa, are you around? Uh, yes, yes, sir. I, I, I couldn't hear it properly. Actually, the internet. Sorry, sir. No, oh, the good pictures. So the originality. So uh, <laughs> sir is asking whether your drawings can be reused or be required to take permission from you. Copyrights should be asked for copyrights. <laughs> oh no, no, sir. No, sir. I would be happy to share, sir. I would. It's just my one. Okay. so i would be definitely happy to uh, they are very meaningful they are very meaningful those pictures are very very meaningful thank you so much thank you sir
Especially that is one question which has... Yeah, I, I was also looking at that only. Uh, so what is the, to what extent uh, bisphosphonate can be used in pediatric? I mean, is it that medicine which is given simply? So can you take that? Uh, uh, yes, bisphosphonate yeah. should not be used like a simple medicine. It always has to be given by experts only in the rarest of the rare cases where uh, the BMD is not improving by the other measures it is given. Uh, so it's uh, the uh, medicine which is least used, least commonly used for idiopathic hypercalciuria and always two, three expert has been, uh, has to be incorporated while uh, taking such decisions. So it's not a simply used medicine for IH. Okay, I think, uh, uh, Kalaimani, I think uh, we have answered all the questions. Yeah, I think we have finished it on time. I think all the speakers did a great job, Disha, Jalpa, and uh, it was well moderated by Vaishali. We'll have the next session on uh, July 20th. And uh, we'll have start the polling session from July 23rd. And so I request all the fellows and trainees to participate in the polling session. Okay. Thank you. Thank Good you night. so much, uh, Vaishali. Thank you, Jalpa. Thank you. Thank you, Jalpa. Thank you, Jalpa. Both of them you did a great job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.